Black Beauty, Chapter 13, The New Stable Boy We arrived home from our trip to visit the squire's friends a few days later. John was waiting at the stable to help James settle Ginger and me back into our stalls. He was glad to hear that James had done well with the driving. That meant James would soon be ready to go to his new job. I wonder who's going to take my job here, James said. It's already been decided, John told him. Little Joe Green will be coming in to start tomorrow. Little Joe? James exclaimed. But he's only a child. He's 14 and a half, John said. And he may be small, but he's quick and kind-hearted and eager to learn. That's why I've agreed to give him a chance for six weeks. If he does well in that time, he'll get the job. He's starting right away so you can help me teach him what to do. The next day, little Joe arrived at the stable bright and early. He was just as young and small as John and James had said. And it was plain to see that he didn't know anything at all about working in a stable. But he was ready and willing to learn everything he could. He always had a cheerful expression on his face and a kind word for us horses. He liked to whistle while he worked, and I enjoyed listening to his happy tunes. Little Joe soon learned how to sweep the stable, to bring in hay and straw, and to clean the harness. He was always quick to offer to help with anything that needed to be done, from cleaning out the stalls to polishing the carriage. And he never complained, even when the work was hard or dull. James seemed pleased with the new boy's progress. After a while, he decided it was time to teach him how to groom a horse. You're a little too short to do much good with Black Beauty or Ginger. I'm afraid you can't even reach halfway up their sides, <laughs> James said with a chuckle. I'll have to teach you on merry legs. In fact, I'm going to put you in charge of taking full care of merry legs from now on, with John keeping an eye on you, of course. Mary Legs has always been a special favorite of mine, so you'd better do a good job. Oh, I will, sir, Little Joe said eagerly. Thank you, sir. At first, Mary Legs wasn't very pleased about this new plan. I heard him grumble more than once about being handled by a boy who knew nothing. But Little Joe did his best to do everything right. By the end of the second week, the pony was complaining much less. He even told me he thought the boy might turn out okay after all. At last the day arrived for James to leave for his new job. Everyone was very sad to see him go. Even James himself looked sad when he came to the stable for the last time. I'm excited about my new job, of course, he told John with a sigh. But I can't stop thinking about everything I'll be leaving behind here. I'll miss you and the squire and everyone else here too. Then there are the horses and my good little merry legs. What will I do without them? It's very hard on all of us to see you go, James, John told him. Especially on me. You've been such a help to me for the past few years. So I don't blame you for being sad. In fact, I'd be disappointed if you weren't. James smiled at that. Cheer up, though, John went on. You're a fine worker, and you'll soon make friends at your new place. Thanks for everything, James said. I'll miss you. Then he walked around the stable and gave us all a few more pats and scratches. A moment later, he was gone. We all missed him a lot over the next week or two, but no one missed him more than Merry Legs. The pony pined after James so much that he stopped eating for a few days. John decided the best way to cheer him up was to give him more exercise. So the next few times he took me out, he brought Merry Legs along with us on a lead. The little pony trotted and galloped along by my side, and that did the trick. 
Before long Merry Legs was just as playful and cheerful as ever. Black Beauty Chapter 14 Riding for the Doctor One night soon after James had left Birtwick Park for his new job, I was awakened from a sound sleep by the clang of the stable bell. John came running in. His clothes were askew as if he'd pulled them on very quickly. Wake up, beauty! He called. You must go as fast as you can! Almost before I knew what was happening, he had my saddle and bridle on. Then he led me out and jogged me over toward the main house. The squire was standing in the doorway wrapped in a robe. Ride for your life, John, he said in a hoarse, anxious voice. Or rather, ride for your mistress's life. There's not a moment to lose. Give Dr. White this note, and then give your horse a rest at the inn. After that, start back as soon as you can. John took the note from the squire and put it in his pocket. Yes, sir, he said. We'll ride swiftly. He swung into the saddle, urging me into a trot as we passed through the gates. Once we were out on the road, he touched my side with his heel, asking me to canter. I was fully awake by now and feeling extra alert due to the unusual situation. It was a moonlit night and almost as bright as day. Everything looked and felt a little different than it did in the daytime. Still, I knew that John would take care of me, and so I wasn't afraid. Soon we came to a long, level stretch of road along the river. Now, beauty, John said, do your best. He closed his legs against my side, and I understood instantly what he wanted. Stretching my legs, I burst into a gallop. For the next two miles, I ran as fast as I could. Even my racehorse ancestors couldn't have done any better. When we reached a bridge, John pulled me back to a trot and patted me. Well done, beauty! He said. Good boy! On the other side of the bridge, John seemed willing to continue at the trot. But it was a clear, frosty night, and I was still feeling good and ready to run. When I moved into a canter, and then a gallop, he allowed me to do so. We passed through a sleepy village and continued on our way. After eight miles, we finally reached the larger town. It was very quiet, and my hooves clattered on the pavement. John steered me toward a street near the market square. The church clock struck three as we stopped outside the doctor's house. John rang the bell twice, and then knocked loudly on the door. An upstairs window slid open. Ooh, what is it? Dr. White called down, sounding sleepy. Mrs. Gordon is very ill, sir, John called back. The squire is afraid she'll die if you don't come right away. I'll be right down, the doctor said. The window slid shut again. Moments later, Dr. White was hurrying out toward us, buttoning his coat. There's just one problem, he told John. My son had to go somewhere tonight and took my horse. Can I ride yours? John gave me a worried look. He came at a gallop almost the whole way, sir, he told the doctor. I was going to let him rest before heading back. But I suppose the squire would want you to take him if there's no other choice. Soon the doctor was climbing into the saddle. I don't wish to say too much about our ride back to Birtwick Park. The doctor was heavier than John, and not as good a rider. For those reasons, the second eight miles felt much longer than the first. But I did my very best, galloping as fast as I could for most of the way. When we came to a steep hill, Dr. White brought me down to a walk. All right, boy, he said kindly, giving me a pat. Take a breath here before we go on. Once we reached the top of the hill, all he had to do was touch my sides with his heels. Then I was off again at a run. The squire was waiting for us when we got back. Little Joe stood nearby, yawning and looking sleepy. The doctor jumped down and hurried into the house with the squire but I had no energy to watch them go. I was dead tired. Come 
on, Black Beauty, Little Joe said as he took me by the bridle. John won't be back for a while since he has to walk the whole way home. But don't worry, I'll take good care of you. Little Fox <laughs>